In the reign of Shah Jahan, Dara Shiko, and the Mystic Five, exploring the secret of the inner sound current, Sultan ul Azkar. Just listen. Dara Shiko, 1615 to 1659, the eldest son of Emperor Shah Jahan, was a remarkable figure in the history of Sufism in India. He was on intimate terms with such luminaries as Sarmad, Mullah Shah, Mian Mir, Guru Har Rai, and his own sister, the famed Princess Jahanara Begum. Although Dara's life was tragically cut short at the hands of his younger brother, Aurangzeb, over a succession dispute, his spiritual and historical writings continue to fascinate and have had a significant influence on the lives of Hindu, Sikh, and Islamic mystics. Prince Dara Shiko, or Shuka, as he is popularly known, straddled two worlds simultaneously, that of politics and that of religion. He was adept at the latter, but inadequate, or even naive, in the former. Despite being Shah Jahan's favoured son, to succeed him as the Mughal leader, Dara was more passionate and successful in his spiritual quest than he was in his military pursuits. Because of this, he was vulnerable to his brothers, who were more ambitious and treacherous in their pursuit of their father's throne. Yet today, the memory of Prince Dara Shika lives on, and his reputation shines ever brighter because of his deep devotion to the interior quest for God-realization and for doing pioneering work in translating and publishing books that merged two oceans, Hinduism and Islam, and which sought a common and unifying core. I first became keenly interested in researching Dara Shiko's life and work when I was commissioned by Cambridge University Press to write a short history of Shabd and Nada Yoga in India and its influence on new religions around the world. I was particularly struck by a passage in Dara Shiko's book, The Compass of Truth, where he argued that listening to the inner sound was the greatest of all spiritual practices. Professor Scott Kugel's translation from the original Persian is revealing. There is no practice better than that of hearing this sound. This is because every other practice depends upon the will of the practitioner. If for a moment stops it, the practice ceases. But not so this practice. It does not depend upon the will of the practitioner. It is present and available without ceasing and without interruption at all times. Dara's explication of Nada, or Shabd Yoga, was and still is, the best short summary of the practice I have ever come across. What is even more captivating is that Dara learned of this ancient technique from both Hindu yogis and his Sufi teachers, Mian Mir and Mullah Shah. As I dug deeper into the life and work of Dara Shiko, I became intrigued by his cosmopolitan outlook on the mystical quest. Unlike his younger brother, Aurangzeb, who gravitated to a more fundamentalist and orthodox view of religion, Dara desired to see the unity of differing faiths, each that would underline and reinforce the revelations in the Quran. Among the many spiritual leaders Dara Shiko encountered in his relatively short life, four stood out to me since they each focused on a threefold meditational technique. One, dhikr, remembrance, usually by intense repetitive prayer, like a Hindu mantra and the Christian Jesus prayer. Two, contemplation of the inner light. And three, listening to the inner sound current. In addition, several of these mystics also enjoined breath control, known in yogic parlance as pranayama. The ancient meditative practice of listening to subtle inner sounds has a long history, dating back to the pre-Vedic period in India. However, it is only in the past six to seven hundred years in India, that Shabd or Nada Yoga has become more widely known and adopted as a primary method for eliciting higher states of consciousness, with the stated goal of experiencing oneness with the transcendent being. The ancient Sanskrit text, Nadabindu Upanishad, provides salient details on how the practice is performed, setting up the basis for later iterations of the yogic technique. 31. The yogin being in the Siddhasana, posture, and practicing the Vaishnavi mudra, should always hear the internal sound through the right ear. 32. 
the sound which he thus practices, makes him deaf to all external sounds. Having overcome all obstacles, he enters the Turiya state within 15 days. 33. In the beginning of his practice, he hears many loud sounds. They gradually increase in pitch and are heard more and more subtly. 34. At first, the sounds are like those proceeding from the ocean, clouds, kettle drum and cataracts. In the middle, stage, those proceeding from madala, a musical instrument, bell and horn. 35. At the last stage, those proceeding from tinkling bells, flute, vena, a musical instrument, and bees. Thus, he hears many such sounds more and more subtle. 36. When he comes to that stage when the sound of the great kettle drum is being heard, he should try to distinguish only sounds more and more subtle. 37. He may change his concentration from the gross sound to the subtle, or from the subtle to the gross, but he should not allow his mind to be diverted from them towards others. 38. The mind having at first concentrated itself on any one sound fixes firmly to that and is absorbed in it. 39. It, the mind, becoming insensible to the external impressions, becomes one with the sound as milk with water and then becomes rapidly absorbed in Chidakasa, the Akasa, where Chit prevails. 40. Being indifferent towards all objects, the yogin having controlled his passions, should by continual practice concentrate his attention upon the sound which destroys the mind. 41. Having abandoned all thoughts and being freed from all actions, he should always concentrate his attention on the sound and then his chitta becomes absorbed in it. Many centuries later, the famous 15th century text, Hatha Yoga Pradipika, explained what sounds are preliminary and which are more advanced. In the first stage, the sounds are surging, thundering like the beating of kettle drums and jingling ones. In the intermediate stage, they are like those produced by conch, mridanga, bells, etc. In the last stage, the sounds resemble those from tinklets, flute, vena, bee, etc. These various kinds of sounds are heard as being produced in the body. Though hearing loud sounds like those of thunder, kettle drums, etc., one should practice with the subtle sounds also, leaving the loudest, taking up the subtle one, and leaving the subtle one, taking up the loudest, thus practicing, the distracted mind does not wander elsewhere. Even Western-based religious traditions, particularly the Gnostic schools, have mentioned listening to a divine melody which lifts the soul up to higher regions. As Dr. Andrea Diem, professor of philosophy at Mount San Antonio College, elaborates, in the trimorphic protonoia, it is described in the following way, I am the word who dwells in the ineffable silence. I dwell in undefiled light and a thought revealed itself perceptibly through the great sound, and it, the sound, exists from the beginning in the foundations of the all. But there is a light that swells hidden in silence, and it was the first to come forth. I alone am the word, ineffable, incorruptible, immeasurable, inconceivable. It, the word, is a hidden light, being unreproducible, an immeasurable light, the source of all. It is foundation that supports every movement of the eons that belong to the mighty glory. It is the founding of every foundation. It is the breath of the powers. It is the eye of the three permanences, which exist as a voice by virtue of a thought, and it is a word by virtue of the sound. I, the word, became a foundation for the all. Sufism has expounded on the efficacy of listening to the inner sound current as a way to control the wayward mind. Several Islamic mystics, including Rumi, have spoken at length about hearing heavenly sounds while in deep contemplation. The most accessible and detailed account in the 20th century was articulated by Hazrat Inayat Khan in his now justly famous 
and widely quoted book, The Mysticism of Sound. Abstract sound is called Sauti Samad by the Sufis. All space is filled with it. The vibrations of this sound are too fine to be either audible or visible to the material ears or eyes, since it is even difficult for the eyes to see the form and color of the ethereal vibrations on the external plane. It was the saut e sarmad the sound of the abstract plane, which Muhammad heard in the cave of Gari Hira when he became lost in his divine ideal. The Quran refers to this sound in the words, be, and all became. Moses heard this very sound on Mount Sinai, when in communion with God, and the same word was audible to Christ when absorbed in his heavenly Father in the wilderness. Shiva heard the same Anahad Nada during his Samadhi in the cave of the Himalayas. The flute of Krishna is symbolic of the same sound. This sound is the source of all revelation to the Masters, to whom it is revealed from within. It is because of this that they know and teach one and the same truth. The Sufi knows of the past, present and future, and about all things in life, by being able to know the direction of sound. Every aspect of one's being in which sound manifests has a peculiar effect upon life, for the activity of vibrations has a special effect in every direction. The knower of the mystery of sound knows the mystery of the whole universe. Whoever has followed the strains of this sound has forgotten all earthly distinctions and differences and has reached that goal of truth in which all the blessed ones of God unite. Space is within the body as well as around it. In other words, the body is in the space and the space is in the body. It is an intriguing historical question to ponder on how meditating on subtler and subtler sounds first became known and advocated among spiritual adepts. Arguably, the practice may have arisen in our prehistoric past since any form of deep concentration, by whatever means or by happenstance, tends to make one more keenly aware and cognizant of hidden features within one's own consciousness and neurophysiology. As a historian of Shabd Yoga-related practices, it is too often overlooked that one of the great personages of the 17th century expounded in detail about listening to the inner sound and made the hidden practice more widely known. It is sociologically important to note that two centuries later, this same meditational technique would form the rudimentary basis of a new religious movement in the same city where the magnificent Taj Mahal was built and where Dara Shiko's father was tragically imprisoned by his younger son, Aurangzeb. That movement, founded by Shiv Dayal Singh, 1818-1878, living on an obscure street named Pani Gali in Agra, would eventually become known as the Radha Swamis. From this tradition sprouted many new religious movements across the globe, including Sawan Kirpal Mission, Ekankar, MSIA, Masterpath, Divine Light Mission, Kuan Yin, and many more. Each of these groups make the practice of listening to the inner sound a foundation of their respective teachings. It makes one wonder whether Shabd or Nada Yoga in the guise of Sultan ul Azkar, as taught by Sufi masters such as Sarmad, Mian Mir, Mullah Shah, and Guru Har Rai, key mentors in Dara Shiko's life, was responsible, at least in part, for a certain kind of mystic zeitgeist in Agra, which made listening to the inner sound a more attractive and viable option to those searching for a beneficial spiritual practice. One thing is certain, however, Prince Darshiko's life, though cut brutally short, his brother had his decapitated head sent to their father in a box while he was imprisoned in the large Agra fort, continues to have a significant influence through his numerous writings, which touch at the very core of spirituality and which give hope to all those seeking for a deeper meaning to life and who are reaching out for better ways to probe the innermost reaches of their own consciousness and being. Perhaps one of the best windows into Dara Shiko's spiritual outlook can be viewed through the lens of those mystics he most admired 
and with whom he learned the most about the inward quest. To accomplish this aim, each chapter focuses on five such mystics and what impact they had on him. Our goal is to get a richer understanding of what Dara Shiko himself found most important in trying to unravel the great mystery of religion and its transcendent aims.